So we're going to be starting the chapter on diastereoselectivity, which is uh, chapter 33 in your textbook. And in this uh, online lecture, all I'm going to do today is I just want to cover some of the terms and terminologies uh, that we're going to be using uh, in this uh, section and, and just covering some of the work that you will have already seen in uh, some of the other courses and how they relate to this concept of diastereoselectivity. All right, so obviously, to, before we can understand that, we must, of course, still uh, understand the difference between enantiomers and diastereomers. So in, the most important thing is for enantiomers is that they are non-superposable mirror images of each other. Okay, The key word is the mirror image. And the second key word with an enantiomer is that there must be non-superimposable or superposable, uh, two terms that are often used interchangeably. So uh, with enantiomers, non-superposable mirror images, uh, diastereomers are uh, not uh, mirror images at all of each other, right? But their connectivity of the atoms is pretty much the same. So they're stereoisomers. Uh, effectively, diastereomers have paradiastereomers would have exactly the same IUPAC name. The only difference would be uh, in the uh, point chirality or uh, double bond uh, configurations that they might, uh, that they might have, um, but not making them mirror images of each, of each other. All right, so that's uh, two classical terms which we should know. And then as we move into this concept of selectivity, it's important at this point to, to mention the two concepts of uh, reactions being uh, stereospecific uh, versus being stereoselective. And it's this that we just want to spend a little bit of time looking at what we mean by these two terms, something being stereospecific and then something being stereoselective. So what reactions are stereospecific? Well, you've actually met a whole host of these ones uh, in the past. And the first classic example of a stereospecific reaction is the SN2 reaction, where we have inversion of stereochemistry. So as an example, we could take uh, something that looks like this. We have a leaving group like a tosylate. All right, if you don't know what the tosylate looks like, you really should go and uh, look that up and make sure that you know. Uh, tosylate is a very good leaving group, and we treat it with a nucleophile, uh, perhaps the acetate anion. And when the acetate anion reacts, we have an SN2 reaction uh, that leaves, and there's an inversion of stereochemistry. But it happens very specifically like this. There's no other... Uh, way that this reaction occurs. It's an inversion of stereochemistry. So the stereochemistry of the starting material forces effectively the stereochemistry in the product that we get. And so that's why it is a specific stereospecific type of reaction. Uh, E2 reactions are also stereospecific. Uh, and this is uh, elimination that occurs in one step. Uh, so if we just uh, draw out, this is an example. You should be able to, to do this, but I want to work through this one just to remind you uh, of uh, how, these, how we work out these reactions. Um, when we do a, an E2 elimination, remember what happens is the base removes the proton and the leaving group goes away in the same step. So we have some sort of base present. Um, let's just, for argument's sake, use methoxide as a base. And we pick up that proton. This one goes there, and that one leaves over there. Well, that's half the story, of course, because the important thing with an E2 elimination, if you can remember this uh, uh, correctly, is that it has to be an antiperiplanar uh, elimination. The way I've drawn it here, we pretty much set up for that. So the proton and the bromine on opposite sides, but they have to be 180 degrees apart from each other. And the way that we work this out is, is 
But there are two methods. The one is using the sawhorse projection, and the other one is a Newman projection. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the Newman projection is a better one for you to, to, to look at. And I want to just make sure that we can do the drawing of the Newman projection of this compound to work out how E2 elimination occurs. Um, because we need to use the Newman projection when we do the Falcon on uh, model, which we're going to get to in the next lecture. So just to remind you, that the way we do the Newman projection is we're looking down this bond over here. Um, so what I do is I stick my little eye there, and we're looking down this bond. Whenever we draw this, uh, as we're looking in the plane, this one, as we're looking down that, this, this one is pointing straight up, and this one is pointing straight down. That's assuming that we're looking down the plane this way, all right, so we're sticking our eye here, looking across. Um, so I draw out the standard sort of Newman structure, um, and then we fill in the bits. And we've got the stuff at the back, and we've got the right. Okay, so this is a staggered confirmation for the Newman projection for this compound over here. So this is this one over here, so that's a methyl group, that's a CH3, goes down to the bond, which is in the middle. We're looking down that bond, straight down the bond, okay. Um, over there, and at the back we have the T-butyl, this over here, T-butyl group is um, directly behind. Okay, so that's, this line here is the plane of the paper that we have over there. Right, that zigzag is there, going to the back, and then coming down again at the back over there. Um, above the plane of the paper is the bromine, which is actually the left-hand side of this molecule. So the bromine is sitting here. Uh, and then on the right hand side is a hydrogen which we haven't drawn uh, in. Okay, so that's that one center. And over here on the left hand side at the back, this one which is part of the circle there, uh, we have the methyl group, CH3, and we have the hydrogen pointing at the back over there. Now I drew this structure out very easily, so to or in a simple way to help us, such that the hydrogen was already behind the bromine. So you can see these are the things that are going to leave. The way this has already been drawn, it's already set up for, for us. So the base is going to pick up this proton, we're going to form a double bond, and the bromine is going to leave that anti-periplanar to each other. Um, but what we can see is when those get removed, um, the T-butyl and the H are on the same side, and the two methyl groups are on the same side. So in the product, when we draw the double bond, the methyl and that methyl are on the same side, uh, and the T-butyl group is on the same side as the hydrogen. We don't have to draw it in, uh, and we can draw the T-butyl. So this would be the only product that we would get for an E2 elimination on this compound here. So this is another example of a stereospecific reaction. All right, um, The chirality of the leaving group over here and the chirality of the carbon next door to it inform us, inform the reaction that only this uh, product over here will be the uh, the preferred one. Okay, this uh, E uh, double bond. Right, so <clears throat> that's two examples. Uh, there's one more example that we've just recently covered in in class, and that is the uh, uh, is epoxides. Um, I'm not going to say too much uh, about that because we have been covering that in the the opening of. Uh, of of e epoxides and epoxides themselves. Uh, are stereospecific because when the nucleophile comes in, whatever the nucleophile might be, it has to come in from the opposite side of the epoxide. Remember that from, from class. Uh, so it's very, uh, opening of epoxides, just as I say, another example, it's very similar to the SN2 reaction, and that is how those ones must work. Okay. So what about stereoselective reactions? Well, stereoselective reactions are reactions where we're getting some kind of selectivity going on. We've already seen examples of this. Um, but it's not uh, happening in a very specific way, like SN2 and E2. Uh, so a good example of this would, of course, be the E1 reaction. Uh, if I had to put up an example of an E1 reaction, uh, something like this would be a good idea. We'd put a phenyl group there. Sorry, that's a P. Uh, we stick an OH on. All right, if we, we did an elimination, we, we took off this OH group uh, via E1. We form a carbocation here, which is fine because it's stabilized being 
next door to the phenyl group, so it can form fairly, fairly easily. How do we take the OH off? Well, we, we add a strong acid, so H2SO4. Uh, so when we take that OH off, we're doing that by protonating it, making it into water. We'd have to probably heat this up a little bit. Uh, and um, so make that into water. It leaves, and we get this intermediate uh, carbocation being formed. And this intermediate carbocation then undergoes a second uh, step in the reaction where the hydrogen can leave, all right, uh, the water that was given off can act as a, uh, as a base and pick up the proton, pick up the proton, this proton will leave and we form a double bond. Uh, but it's in the forming of the double bond that um, we could get either the cis or trans alkene being formed, but the one that is preferred is the transalkene for the very simple reason that it is the most thermodynamically stable one. So this one would be the major product, uh, but we have to understand that, of course, the minor product is, is a likely uh, contaminant, if you will, uh, in, the, uh, in this reaction as well. So we get the E or the trans as the major product and the Z or the cis as the minor product. Uh, overall, this reaction is stereoselective um, because the, uh, this is the thermodynamically favored product, but it's not because of the stereochemistry that, was, uh, that informs it uh, in the beginning over there. And then another good example of a stereoselective reaction, which we've done, is that when we do reactions at uh, uh, six-membered uh, rings, uh, and specifically the uh, uh, six-membered uh, ketones, um, <clears throat> or ring ketones, like a cyclohexanone, the textbook has a very good example um, where it uses not a cyclohexanone, but uh, a papyridine, which is this, but a papyridinone, so we're going to I think on that. There's a methyl group on it over here and another methyl there. Uh, and it does a reaction and it says, okay, let's take some phenyl lithium. That's a nucleophile. It's going to go towards the ketone. So adds on, we get the ketone. But the important thing is we, we've got some stereochemistry here. It hasn't, we haven't been told what that is, but it's going to be both up and down. It's one chiral center, so it must be racemic. Uh, it's up or down. Uh, and in the one exam, the one case, let's just take the case of where the, uh, the methyl group is, is facing down, um, then, so methyl group is facing down, uh, then what happens is the phenyl that added comes into the top and the new alcohol that's formed in this um, Grignard type, it's not a magnesium, but for the phenyl lithium, similar principle, uh, gets uh, goes onto the opposite side of the methyl group over there. Why? Uh, because when the methyl group is down, it'll be in an equatorial position. That means the nucleophile, which was big, comes in in such a way that it goes into the equatorial position. So these two are equatorial to each other, and this ended up in an axial position. This was the rule that when we've got the six-membered rings, ketones, right? when you have a large nucleophile, it prefers to be Equatorial, small nucleophile prefers to be axial. Okay, so uh, and important thing here is that this is obviously racemic as well, but we're only getting this diastereomer in preference because it was a large nucleophile wanting to end up being in an equatorial position. Okay, so that's another example of a stereoselective uh, reaction. So I want you to go and uh, check up on that in your textbook uh, again. Look at some of the other examples that we, we have there. But this was just to remind you of some of the stuff that we have already done. Um, our next lecture is going to be an important one in looking at a new transition state for a stereoselective reaction and how we predict uh, the, the major product. Uh, and, uh, and that is the, the Falcon R uh, transition state.